cities. China has a lot of them. 687 in fact, and counting. I've been to a few myself and discovered modern metropolises with amazing infrastructure and an international outlook. I've also seen a fair few works in progress too. China's enthusiasm for urbanisation is unlike anything the world has seen before and it's currently building five times more houses per year than the US and Europe combined. But this rapid growth has not come without significant environmental and social costs. And as the world's eyes are firmly fixed on China's urban areas, to see whether the past 40 years of progress is simply a bubble waiting to burst or a preview of the future of human civilization. It's time to share the story of China's cities. A lively debate continues on just how far reform should go, just how rich is too rich. It is quite remarkable. It, it, it happens so quickly. A victim of the speculative real estate bubble currently gripping China. Just because you build it doesn't mean they'll come. It wasn't always this way. Chinese art traditionally depicted idyllic countryside scenes, and for much of the last 5,000 years, this is truly how people lived. In the self-reliant Middle Kingdom, people grew what they needed, and life was simple. Even by the year 1950, just 13% of China's population lived in cities. Yet nowadays, that has risen to 60%. And out of the top 100 biggest cities in the world, 25 of them are in China. So what's changed? Well, in the latter part of the 20th century, the government introduced widespread reforms that transformed the efficiency of the agricultural sector, meaning that there was less need for everybody in the country to devote themselves to growing rice or grain. This paved the way for the wider economic reforms of the late 70s, and as the economy opened up to international trade, China went from making things for itself to manufacturing for the whole world. The government formed a series of special economic zones, including Shanghai and Shenzhen. These were a roaring success, and the way that the latter morphed from a series of fishing villages into a huge metropolitan city in the space of a few decades was a sign of things to come. Workers searching for a better life flocked to the ever-expanding cities in their millions making this period the largest migration in human history. Once they arrived, they often ended up working long hours doing grueling factory work. Many were from poor rural backgrounds, but they didn't let their lack of education stop them from looking towards the future. In China, family comes first, and this first generation of migrant workers ploughed their savings into educating their children, hoping that they will carry on this forward momentum. Many of them sent their kids to university in the hope that they would have a future beyond the production line. When I went to Shenzhen in 2018, I didn't see many factories, but rather huge skyscrapers housing world-class technology firms. Whilst China's first steps towards modernization might have been the manufacturing boom of the 80s and 90s, over time the economy carried on its evolution and Chinese companies have gone from being a cheap alternative to a genuine competitor. There is a reason why both my phone and my drone are Chinese in origin. But back to the cities themselves. These are split into four tiers, with the first tier cities generally having the highest level of infrastructure and biggest GDP. But the lower tier cities are hardly second rate. When you walk around the streets of these modern metropolises, it can be easy to forget just how far they've come in so little time. But even as recently as the 90s, life in the city was a totally different beast. For most people, owning a home was illegal until a state council decision in 1998 ended the system of employer-allocated housing once and for all. 
And yet nowadays, around 90% of households own at least one home, compared to 65% in the US. If you travel to the outskirts of any Chinese city, you will see cranes constructing rows upon rows of identical tower blocks at a rate unimaginable to anyone in the West. In the major cities, house prices are rising rapidly, competition is fierce, and not just for economic reasons. In China, if your son is wishing to get married, then owning his own home is kind of a must, or at least having the down payment for one. Families will often club together cash to show potential suitors that their son has a serious economic future. I do think it's important that I stress that this practice isn't the same for every young couple, and I've met a few Chinese people that long for a quieter life, Ella Lizzie Chi, away from the rat race of the city. But as property prices continue to rise, the pressures that young Chinese people face are only going to increase. One solution to the shortage of affordable housing is building new cities entirely, often in obscure locations. Entirely new settlements are popping up across the country with hospitals, schools, and malls. But oftentimes people are snapping up these apartments as investment properties, not looking to actually move there, leading to the widely talked about phenomenon of ghost cities. As seen in Jamie XX's Gosh music video and many dramatic news reports. Everything is here, an entire city. All the buildings, the roads, schools, hospitals, you name it. Everything that is, except the people. There are success stories, however, such as Zhangdong in Hunan province. The local government moved university campuses from neighboring Zhengzhou and convinced Foxconn, the company that manufactures the iPhone, to open a factory there. And the city was converted from a much ridiculed ghost city to an example of China's capacity to build something from seemingly nothing. However, I feel like we might be getting a little bogged down in the minute details here. And it's one thing judging Chinese cities by facts and figures and another discovering them for yourself. I've been to a few Chinese cities myself, and each one has made a different impression on me. There was my first home of Nanjing, which was surprisingly relaxed for such a large place. A tall mountain and a huge lake lay at its core, and I loved taking a stroll on the wall that enclosed the city. During my time there, I visited the nearby cities of Hongzhou, which I described at the time as the most beautiful city in China. I don't think I was wrong, although feel free to debate that in the comment section. I also visited Suzhou, known as the Venice of the East, which was beautiful, although absolutely baking in the July heat. I have spent many a weekend in Shanghai, but never really filmed there because simply speaking, I was too busy having fun. Then I discovered Northerly Beijing, the adopted home that stole my heart because of its unique Kutong culture and historical aura. And down south, there is Shenzhen, which I mentioned earlier, the gleaming city in the Pearl River Delta, which gave me a glimpse into the future. Better still though, was Chongqing, which had more of a gritty feel to it and came alive at nighttime. I guess what I'm trying to say is my knowledge and experience in Chinese cities is ever evolving, much like the cities themselves. So do leave me a comment letting me know where I should visit and learn about next. I hope you liked this video. If you did, give me a big thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more China-related content. I'll see you next time.